Welcome to the third of this year's Dalhousie Health Justice Institute seminar series. I'm Sheila Wildman, uh, Associate Director of the Institute. We meet, as you know, in the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq, Alastigway, and Asmaquani peoples, sovereign nations holding inherent rights as the original peoples of these lands. We come together in a spirit of readiness to reflect on and advance those inherent rights, mindful of our collective obligations under the Peace and Friendship Treaties and Section 35 of the Constitution Act, 1982, which recognizes and affirms Aboriginal and Treaty Rights in Canada. We reflect, too, on the profound fact that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies, and contributions have enriched this part of Mi'kmaq being known as Nova Scotia for over 400 years. So uh, turning to today's speaker, who is known uh, and beloved to many of you uh, in this room, <coughs> Professor Naomi of Wildwood Metallic is from the Listigouche Mi'kmaq First Nation in Gaspegawaki, sorry, Gaspegawaki. Gaspegawaki. Gaspegawaki, thank you. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Professor? Uh, I am an associate professor. I, got that wrong. I sent you my bio. <laughs> Thank you. I like the L's. Currently <laughs> pushing a PhD at the University of Alberta. She was a law clerk to the Honorable Michelle Basterash of the Supreme Court of Canada in 2006 and 7. Naomi still continues to practice law with Virgil's Wickwire Bryson LLP in Halifax, where she practiced for nearly a decade before joining the law school's faculty, primarily in the firm's Aboriginal Law Group. As a legal scholar, uh, as many of you know, she is most interested in and extremely accomplished at uh, writing about how the law can be harnessed to protect the well-being and self-determination of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And just briefly on a more personal note, Naomi is my neighbor on the third <laughs> floor of the law school, just right behind the wall, uh, so sometimes we hear each other. Uh, she's a fierce, uh, fierce, but you know, loving, kind uh, powerhouse and life force of intellectual, moral, uh, and student support at, the, at this um, school. She's enlivened our faculty since joining uh, it in ways that I can't begin to describe. I know how life-changing she has been for many students, even as she has shown uh, scholarly and advocacy leadership nationally on some of the most important justice issues affecting Indigenous communities um, in our times. So it's with equal measures, awe, and delight that I can speak to my ah. colleague, Danny Metallic. That's so cute. Thank you. <laughs> Malala and Sheila, um, thank you so much. That was really, really a kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Well, Dasi Begis and Giskuk, I'm happy to be here with you guys today and um, to talk about uh, something that has been in my life for a long time. I was reflecting on deciding to give this talk um, and uh, this particular issue, like, you know, I don't really believe people have origin stories, but if I was to have an origin story, I would say my origin story is the case that I'm going to talk to you about and this particular issue which uh, you know, came into my life when I was a fourth year associate at my law firm and uh, at the time was still sort of you know, uh, building up my chops and figuring out my practice area but it sort of pushed me into more litigation for the rest of the time that I was actively in practice, uh, a lot of this case taking up that time. Um, and then it also was what fueled me to become an academic and uh, um, to write in particular about the issues that I'm going to talk to you about that I'm specifically focusing on social assistance in First Nations communities, um, but the 
systemic problems that I'm going to explain are ones that um, affect every area of social assist or of, of, of essential services for uh, First Nations people living on reserves. And so have spent a good chunk of my academic career trying to write about and inform people about this issue. Um, this is interesting, and I continue to have reflections on it. As you see by the end of this, I kind of have a pushing myself at my own call to action on what to do next on this matter. And um, yeah, sometimes I kind of beat myself up and thinking maybe I haven't done enough on this yet. But anyway, the story's not over and it's still moving forward. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll get into the story. Um, and I think I'll start, well, first of all, let me tell you what these two um, graphics are. So these are the two logos. Uh, for uh, one is the Wallistoe Nation, so uh, the Wallistoe in New Brunswick. They're the people of the beautiful St. John River. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work with them, and started this case started with doing work for the First Nations in New Brunswick. And the other logo is uh, for Mi'kmaq Well de Budahan um, Incorporated, which is the Mi'kmaq organization in New Brunswick. As part of what I'm going to describe, I've also done work with the Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq, um, but for the last eight years or so, they have been doing their own thing, and I'm less familiar about sort of the direction that they've gone in, so have come at, with the explicit permission of my clients to tell the stories. They have no issue with me telling the story. They'd like more people to know about it, and uh, certainly uh, some change to happen in that regard. I was thinking about how to frame what, uh, what, how to like, what is the sort of takeaway, I guess, to take this. So I went back to something that my uh, dear friend now, who actually I became friends with in the process of working on this case, she had another case um, happening at a parallel process at the Canadian Human Rights Commission that is similar about uh, child welfare services in First Nations. And uh, so this is, if those of you who don't know her, um, Cindy, Dr. Cindy Blackstock, who is a Gitsan social worker uh, from British Columbia, who has dedicated her entire life uh, to raising awareness uh, about the profound inequities in the delivery of uh, essential services to First Nations children. And uh, the little fellow on her shoulder is Spirit Bear. He is a bear who I think has actually taken on sort of human qualities throughout the case that she led. Um, she always uses him as a symbol of the children that, uh, all the children that she has been representing in the, uh, the court hearings and we would always take the bear um, to tribunal hearings and court hearings. And I have intervened in cases with her and it's also a part of the deal that you gotta take the bear to court. So uh, that's all good, I'm fine with that. Um, but uh, Cindy has always said something in the, in the context of uh, the work that she does and unfortunately in the work that I'm gonna describe to you this saying continues to bear to ring true to me, which is um, discrimination is when the government doesn't think you are worth the money. And I you know, tend to still think, even though I've been fighting on this issue for ooh, about 15 years now, that uh, we're, still, we're still dealing with this, this challenge. Okay, uh, so where I'm gonna start is explaining how essential services, as, particularly social welfare, so welfare, social assistance. I'll probably call it social assistance for the most of the lecture. Um, but explaining how it works in First Nations communities that is quite different from how it works uh, within the province. Um, so whereas, you know, in Nova Scotia, for example, it's uh, the province who funds, it's the province who sets the rules, it's the province who delivers the services, we don't have that in the First Nations context. It's quite a bit more complicated. So the, the services are funded by the federal government uh, through what are called funding agreements. Uh, there's different types. Um, I'll say a little bit more about them after. Funding agreements with First Nations to deliver services. So I guess that also covers off uh, number three. So the feds fund uh, First Nations to deliver these services, and so they have funding agreements with First Nations governments. Um, but the rules that the government relies on to do this, oddly, are provincial rules. Um, and so, uh, but indirectly. So the, the feds say we're going to use prov provincial rules around social assistance as the, as the standard uh, to be applying um, on, in First Nations, which perhaps, you know, at an initial level sounds okay, so it seems to maybe make sense, but there are certainly challenges with that that I'll walk you through. 
Okay, so that's the, the, the general difference. But let me explain a little bit of the history around why it looks the way that it does. So this arises um, primarily after World War II when we kind of get the birth of the social safety net in Canada and in other, uh, in other nations ar around the world. So the development of programs and services to ensure that you know, uh, income inequality, that people are protected, at least have some protections. Um, so where, when, and this is, you know, when we have uh, old age security and other income security mechanisms coming to the fore, um, we have a situation as, as these programs are being developed and the administrative state is being developed um, that neither the federal nor the provincial governments are actually providing any of these services that are starting to be rolled out to First Nations. So it becomes recognized that that is the case. Um, that, they are, that First Nations are not receiving the same services that other ci citizens are receiving. And um, so a joint committee was formed uh, by the federal government to investigate um, the fact that there was this inequity. Um, however, the sort of the general view at the time and the recommendation of the federal committee um, is sort of relying on a, a formalistic concept of equality. Uh, which we, we see in other things around this time period. I'm talking about the 50s and the 60s. Some of you might be familiar with the white paper policy, and that's when Trudeau uh, Sr. and um, uh, Jean Chrétien had put forward a proposal to get rid of reserves, to get rid of treaty obligations, to entirely erase um, any um, specific legal status that Indigenous people had, as well as the Indian Act and reserves. And the hope was to, that Indigenous people would, you know, assimilate or, or be absorbed into um, the political mainstream and become primarily the responsibility of the provinces. So that idea was sort of, you know, a wafting around in, in this time period. And that idea influenced um, the committee at the time who was studying what should happen and who should be delivering services uh, to First Nations people on reserve. Uh, yeah, so their solution was a similar idea. Let's, let's get the provinces to take this over. They should be the responsibility of the provinces. So that was the recommendation of a federal committee to the federal government, and we're talking uh, um, uh, the 1950s. So what, the, or early, late 40s, early 50s. Um, so after this, the, um, uh, the federal government takes this advice and in fact attempts to legislate this recommendation in a not very direct way, but uh, it amended, there's massive overhaul to the Indian Act that occurred in 1951. Now, at this point, the federal government could have legislated about the delivery of essential services to First Nations people in the Indian Act. It did not do so because it did not want to do so, and instead, picking up the advice from the provincial governments uh, or from that committee, uh, it was attempting to sort of shirk off those responsibilities to the provinces. Uh, and so Section 88 was inserted into the Indian Act. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, what it says is that all provincial laws of general application apply to Indians under the Indian Act. And it was an attempt unilaterally by the federal government to essentially say, ah, well, provincial welfare laws will apply uh, on reserve. There was one problem with this <laughs> attempted solution. And that is that the provision of these services costs money, which the provincial governments did not want to pay for our First Nations people. Uh, so they said, yeah, no, no, not gonna, not gonna do it. They were extremely reluctant. Uh, they said, the only way that we're going to extend our services, and most were even reluctant to do that, is if you pay for it all, Canada. You pay for it, sure. Well, actually, with respect to, this happened with respect to some child welfare programming, which is a separate lecture, but with respect to social assistance, in fact, there was only one province who got on board with that idea, which was Ontario. So Ontario and the federal government signed an agreement in 1965 for sort of a primarily cost shared, or primarily paid by the federal government, a little bit of cost sharing by the, uh, the province, but um, offering these services. Um, so, um, and for the most part, all the other provinces told Canada to go pound sand. Like, no, it's not going, not going to happen. But Canada retained hope. And in fact, had a, some legislation at the time um, uh, 
I think on the Canada Pension Plan, but also had set out a mechanism where provinces and the federal government could come to an agreement specifically about the extension of provincial welfare services to First Nations uh, on reserve. But it never really happened. Um, and so, uh, and I was talking to Michaela about this earlier, but yes, I, I call this the political hot potato because uh, uh, this, um, this attitude of no, they're your problem, no, they're your problem, really we start seeing that at this point um, when the delivery of important services to First Nations uh, comes on the scene. And this debate continues uh, today in a variety of different ways. Um, and so, yeah, we, we see this uh, political hot potato issue. So Canada, still hoping against hope that it might be able to eventually convince the provinces to come on side and take over these services to First Nations, um, does recognize at some point, and there is pressure on it by some advocates saying, well, Indigenous folks on reserve are not receiving any services right now, like that other people are. So Canada decided to, uh, or obtain the Department of Indian Affairs at the time, today we call it Indigenous Services, um, they went to Treasury Board, um, they didn't pass legislation, but they went to Treasury Board and uh, sought an approval to provide social assistance um, on reserve. Um, so this document is, was and remains the main document <laughs> for the provision of services, uh, important essential services to uh, First Nations people, even up to today. Oddly enough, not legislation, just a treasury board authority. It's quite short, quite you know, oblique, but it essentially says that uh, we approve your request to adopt provincial and local municipal standards and procedures for the administration of relief assistance for Indians. Um, that's, that's sort of essentially it. And so the standard that was sort of accepted through this is that the government was, go the federal government was willing to fund the delivery of essential services based on standards comparable to uh, municipal or provincial standards of relief. I'm going to call that uh, the comparability standard, providing comparable services uh, to uh, First Nations based on provincial or municipal standards. There was a time that municipalities provided more social assistance relief. It uh, has not, it's no longer the norm anymore today. So that's how uh, this approach came about. There's one other piece to it, which is the fact that Indigenous peoples deliver the services uh, these days. And that came about with pressure from First Nations starting in the, I'd say, 70s and the 80s, pressuring the federal government for greater culturally appropriate self-determined services for First Nations. Um, now, the government of the time, it was prim primarily the Mulroney government in the 90s, they were not willing to go so far as to recognize an inherent right to self-govern over these areas. But what they were willing to do was extend this concept called program devolution. So it's essentially, it used to be that the federal government's employees would actually go and deliver welfare checks to people on reserve. But in, with the advent of program devolution, uh, funding was provided to First Nations uh, to hire their own employees to deliver these services through contribution agreements or funding agreements. And these you know, funding agreements contain significant terms and conditions and reporting requirements. Um, the terms and conditions are mandatory and they incorporate this idea that you know, the provincial rules have to be followed. Um, they also impose rules about if uh, the, the, the money, if the First Nation goes into default, that there can be consequences, that somebody can come in and, and control the finances for the First Nation. Um, there can be pretty significant reporting requirements. There was an Auditor General report, I think from two, early 2000s, that found that for one First Nation, even a very small First Nation, they had something like 160 reports required in a year. Um, these funding agreements can vary in terms of their time. There are some that are one year in length, there are some that are four years in length, and these days the government is also pushing agreements that are ten years in length and uh, encouraging them because they, they give some measure of flexibility to First Nations. But an important point to make about these is there's actually not a lot of flexibility in these agreements. It's not self-government in terms of that the terms and conditions are set by the federal government, 
who largely borrow from provincial rules in order to determine the, what the, the program looks like. So there's a lot of issues uh, with the structure of, um, of these services. Um, I mean, coming back to this idea of, you know, Indigenous people becoming, uh, or First Nations people in particular, becoming the responsibility of the provinces being absorbed into the mainstream, that is an idea of assimilation, right? That, that like, lets, uh, you know, uh, Indigenous people shouldn't have their own distinct identities or distinct approaches. Rather, wouldn't it be better if, um, you know, provincial services applied to everyone else, applied to them? Hmm. So that's one problematic feature of these arrangements. Next is that it essentially leaves First Nations out of any social policy development, right? It's the Fed's funding and borrowing from the provincial government. Do you think the provincial government consults with First Nations about the development of its policies? No, why would they? Because their rules are about their people and they say, well, why would we go consult with First Nations? It's not, our, it's not our problem that, you know, the federal government takes our rules and applies them. We don't ask them to. That's not our issue. So you have a, a model of, you know, policy development. It's, it's the weirdest policy development or policy uh, structure that I could possibly imagine. So the group affected, no one is ever really um, asking them or assessing, um, you know, how programs are affecting them. And on that point, I mentioned earlier the reporting requirements that we see that are required under some of these agreements. Um, there's been some studies of what these reports look like, and the funniest thing is that it tends to be, and at various points it's even emphasized more, measuring every dollar spent. Not whether they're increasing well-being, whether they're helping communities, whether they're helping people getting out of dependency. None of that is really looked at. It's just bean counting, essentially. Um, and yeah, so there has been some independent sort of study of the government's uh, use of these reports and finding that they're not using them to actually inform sound policies um, in this uh, really important area that, you know, I will just stop for a second and say this area is not sexy to a lot, a lot of people. I would say even a lot of First Nations leadership don't really want to talk about this area because it's mired in awful stereotypes about First Nations people, like, you know, the welfare bum. Um, and uh, and, it, and it's so much of about an impact of what colonialism did to First Nations people. And so it's kind of like the dirty secret that nobody wants to talk about, but it has such an impact on um, First Nations people. Like, you know, think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like, if you can't eat, and you don't have, you know, if you don't have enough to eat or you don't have sufficient shelter, like, nothing else really matters. And I think that was brought home to me once, I think I was in my third year here and I was at a conference about Indigenous law. And I love talking about Indigenous law, Indigenous law revitalization. And everybody was talking about it and we were having such a great time talking about it. And towards the end, a man steps up. Uh, to the mic and asks the question. He says, this has all been really interesting and I really appreciate that. This was in Alberta. And he said, I'm from the Saddle Lake First Nation. And about 85% of the community is on social assistance. And what of anything that you've said over the past two or three days is going to help them in any way, you know? And so, I mean, that just gutted me, right? That, you know, this has such an impact. People really can't flourish if they are just, you know, basically eking out an existence, if not more than that. So, um, so yeah, that, I just wanted to kind of make that point about this area. So clearly, uh, the fact that, you know, the feds rely on provincial, um, uh, provincial policy clearly indicates that this is not culturally appropriate policy. Um, I've already talked on this a little bit, but the contribution agreements um, that are, uh, uh, that are in place are fundamentally flawed. And, and I've, I've already touched on this a little bit, I could go on more. Another huge issue is that there's no legislation here, there's very little accountability. Um, and I have argued many times that this violates the rule of law, that it provides far too much government discretion, as the case I'll tell you about in a minute uh, shows, and provides opportunities for abuse. There's just very little mechanisms to actually challenge this aside from, I would say, probably human rights or the charter. And I'll come to that a little later. Um, and, it, and it has been found that this area is severely underfunded. Um, 
And uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to move into that right away. Um, but yeah, that there are severe fun uh, funding issues um, and it is resulting in living conditions not improving in First Nations. So let me, let me talk to you a little bit about the case that I was involved in and the journey it has then set, set, uh, set me up upon. I'll primarily be focusing on New Brunswick, although as I said, it, I was, the case we got involved with also involved Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, First Nations, but I'll talk about this. So just to get kind of introduce us into this topic, uh, what you see here on uh, the left hand side is the cover of the 1991 Socialist First Nations Social Assistance Manual for New Brunswick, so a list of 15 First Nations. Um, so that was passed in 1991. It looks like that. There is no online version of it. You cannot go search this online and find a copy of it. Yet, despite that, this still applies today in First Nations communities. Um, this hasn't changed. Those of you familiar with social welfare in the provinces know that probably since 1994, the, um, there have been many amendments uh, in, the, in, in the Maritimes uh, provincial policies. Dozens, I would probably venture to guess. Um, but this has not changed. So what, and what particular has not changed are the rates. Um, so I've given you some indication of the, the rates, but we'll just pick the simplest. So an individual who, at short term is for people who are deemed to be employable, essentially, and the long term is the rate for persons with disabilities. Um, but the, the rate for an individual is $80 a week, essentially. And for a person with disabilities, it's $92 a week. And that continues to be the rate that people are receiving in First Nations up to today. And let me tell you a little bit about, more about that story. I'm happy to provide the, the slides after for those who want to get down all those numbers. Um, but essentially, like I say, when I was in my fourth year as an associate at my firm, uh, we, had the, we were working for First Nations in New Brunswick and other places as well. But we had this file come to us where the communities were just freaking out. They were just really, really concerned. They had been in a meeting with uh, re representatives of Indigenous Services Canada or Indian Affairs. They've changed their name many times, so I switched between those, those names. But they essentially had announced, and this was during the Harper years, um, that um, they had recently just realized that uh, they were out of compliance with their 1964 Treasury Board authority. Um, so essentially they, they said, actually, we've got it wrong. We've been interpreting it wrong this whole time. <laughs> we are actually supposed to be mirroring exactly whatever the provinces are doing right now in terms of social assistance. And the fact that we are not doing that puts us out of compliance and we need to uh, we need to change that. So let me just back up the bus for two secs and say a couple of different things. It's really hard to compare uh, First Nations welfare uh, on reserve with what's happening off reserve. It's not apples to oranges, or not apples to apples. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio because it's the federal government attempting. Um, so what happened with, with the development of this manual is that staff from Department of Indian Affairs in the early 90s looked at you know, the provincial policy in New Brunswick and aimed to develop something somewhat similar, but not offering potentially this full panoply of services that the provinces provides. And, every, you know, and the provinces continually shift and adapt their social welfare programs. But so I guess the point I'm trying to get across is that what these policies cover are what I would say are the basic rates. Um, which all provinces have some type of basic rate that people are provided to live and it's intended to cover you know, personal products, uh, personal products, food, uh, utilities, and there's usually some cost of shelter included into it. And so there's this basic rate and sometimes people can get stuff for things called special allowances, which could be like you need, you need an outfit because you're going to a job interview or you need to hire a babysitter. So there's, you know, and, and it can be, there's, there's more than that as well. But that's generally what these, these manuals cover. But provinces also provide a whole panoply of ancillary services that have been, you know, uh, tweaked and developed over the years to complement, supplement um, the broader provincial services. So with First Nations, they really don't have that same layer of ancillary services and they're not eligible for most of them uh, within the province. And the federal government doesn't provide um, the same level of services. So that's the difference and why you can't really compare uh, it like apples and apples. Um, 
But the government in 2011 said something to the First Nations saying, oh yeah, we, we kind of do have to follow it apples to apples. Not those ancillary services. No, 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 no. But we have to follow the basic rates and the special rates that are in place right now. And what so happened to be, if you did, did the calculations, is that at that very moment in time, the provinces in the, um, were you know, providing fairly narrow, basic, and, and special, um, uh, special needs services, but provided this broader panoply. But the federal government wasn't looking at that. It was only looking at basic rates. Um, and so what that, the calculus added to was spending far less than it was already spending on social assistance. Um, and if you don't believe me, <laughs> as part of the case, uh, we got some evidence um, that, that came in and, and essentially showed us that. I'm sorry, it's a little small. Um, but uh, there was more evidence than this, but uh, this, this document uh, does the trick well enough. But essentially, there's a recognition that by taking this new mirroring approach to social assistance, this was going to do things like... Um, uh, it is anticipated to be a lowering of amounts received by income assistance recipients in many cases, in addition to scaling back of shelter and fuel allowances. Uh, First Nations will also have to follow provincial policy on administering the national child benefit. Anyway, there was other documents that sort of got to the, a clear recognition by the, the government employees that this was a scaling back of what was in the 1991 policy. Beyond that, too, there was also a recognition that this would do harm which you know, blows my mind, but they actually have this risk assessment on the uh, second side of the slide where department employees sat around and then like, identified like, what harms might come to primarily them or the department more than indigenous people, but there's a little bit of overlap here. So they recognized that there would be resistance and a legal challenge and a human rights challenge. They recognized that it would create problems for coordination with the provinces in terms of their programming. Um, it recognized uh, spike in workloads for regional staff because they'd have very angry people calling with them with complaints um, and they might have media inquiries. They also thought that their, their, they, their health and safety would be jeopardized in, in dealing with the community. So they thought they might get threats and harassment in the field because they were going to be introducing something so unpopular that um, people would want to do them harm by introducing it. And the one that I think is just absolutely mind-blowing is the impact on other um, Department of ANSI, so at the time it was Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada, again, one of their many names. Um, but they identified that some of their other programs would be affected. So one would be that they were going to change their approach and it would impact how shelter and fuel and housing uh, in First Nations um, operated and it would be reducing that and, and might actually put some, so, so sometimes bans are advanced money by CMHC to build housing and they use some of the funds that come in from social assistance to pay for that. So it's sort of a balancing of the books, but they were going to be sort of cutting back on, on the amounts that were coming in to pay for the shelter in such a way that it might put the bans, uh, you know, agreements to pay back funds on CMH, for CMHC in jeopardy. It's, it's a complicated sort of con uh, discussion, but anyway, uh, that seemed to be a very not well thought out uh, impact. But probably the one that's probably the ickiest of all of them is the second one, which is increased demand on child and family services and other social programs. So some of you may know that you know, at the same time, around the time this was going on, Cindy Blackstock, who I mentioned at the beginning, brought a human rights complaint to the Canadian Human Rights Commission similarly arguing that this similar sort of system in child welfare was at, resulting in the chronic underfunding of children and family services on reserve, uh, leading to the over-representation of Indigenous children in the child welfare system. So they knew that, they knew it was going on, and they recognized that probably by decreasing welfare, they're going to put more kids in that system. So pretty icky and a sort of a recognition that this was... Um, yeah, going to reduce, essentially reduce the 1991 rates. Um, in, so this case was not a human rights case. We brought this as a judicial review of the government's decision to change its interpretation. And so essentially we were fighting for those 1991 rules, which by that point were a couple of decades old, were not adequate in themselves, but what was being proposed was even worse. So you're just fighting to like keep the inadequate status quo. 
Um, so that's a point I have to make about this case. But you know, at the time, the it was real to people. Like there was actually a, a couple of inc reported instances of suicides of people hearing about the change coming and um, reacting um, in in a very very um, sad way. Um, and so um, so the chiefs just said, go and do something about it, and that's what we tried to do. We brought an interlocutory injunction, and we stopped the. Uh, stop the changes from happening because the government wanted it to happen in just a matter of a few weeks. And then we brought a judicial review, um, which we were successful in at the first instance. Um, the court found that it was unreasonable for the federal government to implement a bunch of changes when there, it was clear that there was going to be really harmful impacts and not study those impacts any further. Um, and we also succeeded in making a sort of procedural argument that there was a duty to consult with the First Nations given the impacts on recipients of their, in their communities um, based on the, the Baker factors in administrative law. And it was a long, uh, a long uh, time. Uh, we, we ultimately, though, got overturned at the Federal Court of Appeal. And the court took an odd interpretation. They said the government had no interpretation. It had to uh, absolutely mirror um, the provincial rules. But I think and you know, maybe it's a part of appellate advocacy. You have two hours to explain an extremely complex matter to judges, and they just sort of said, oh yeah, they just have to mirror, and it's as simple as that. But they have to provide the same services as, they do, as the provinces do, which you know, just missed a lot of the important context and the fact that I was trying to say before, it's not apples and apples. Um, and in fact, on that point, um, after the case, uh, after all the dust settled, uh, a researcher digging around at Library and Archives Canada found a document that came out contemporaneously with this 1964 Treasury Board Authority, um, which essentially is a directive to all the staff of the different uh, regions of, of Indian Affairs to say that you know our task is to provide the full range of assistance at the same scales and under the same eligibility conditions as other needy persons in the province. But then goes on to say, it ain't apples and apples, and we have to you know, take some flexibility here. So it may not be possible to adopt all aspects of provincial policy to departmental administration. And so they're, they're then given the marching orders to do their best to ensure that this is you know, adapted to meet the needs of First Nations folks. Um, so that would have helped in the case. It would have been nice if the government would have disclosed that at the time. We did bring it to the attention of their lawyers after the fact, and they said, whoopsie, well, but we don't think it would have helped anyway, is what they said. And if you disagree with us, well, you can just take us back to court. But we didn't want to go back to court because we had been sick of going to court. And um, so eventually, you know, in 2016, there's the election and we get the Trudeau government that comes in. And uh, the chiefs went switch gears from litigation to essentially lobbying. We had all liberal MPs in the Maritimes. And they all went to work talking to those MPs, working really hard to say, please don't implement these changes, please press pause, and let's find a new way forward. And that essentially is what the government of Canada agreed to uh, at that time. And so, yeah, now I'll switch gears into what happened next. Yeah, so I'll take about just 10 more minutes on, on this. So before I get into what we were doing on the ground, let me talk about some legal developments that have been happening since 2016, which are quite important. Um, one is, and I mentioned earlier, Cindy, and the case that she was sort of running at the same time that my case was running. We got, our first meeting was when she got this massive disclosure of documents that Canada had forgotten to disclose in their case. And some of it named me in my case, so she contacted me. And anyway, we've struck up a friendship since then and compared notes and shared these documents. Um, but in her case involving child welfare, under a very similar system, uh, where the government was similarly trying to argue that, well, we do, a f we do provide services comparable to the provinces, uh, but they don't. In fact, in this case, the Human Rights Tribunal found that uh, Canada indeed provides about 22% less. So even at a, you know, if you're trying to do apples and apples, they were, Canada was falling well below that standard. But the beautiful thing about this case is that the court said that's not the standard. The standard is substantive equality, and that's services that meet the needs and circumstances, the distinct needs and circumstances of First Nations children and families living on reserve, including their 
cultural, historical, and geographical needs and circumstances. So that was a different program, but I believe that the principles ought to apply across the board when we're talking about key essential services provided to uh, First Nations people. And since that time, there has been another human rights case in 2019, again, about a different program, but completely based on a similar, all the same problems that I've been talking about, which is policing. So there was a decision from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in 2019 called Dominic, where they found that the chronic underfunding of policing services in First Nations also violated substantive equality and Canada didn't meet the mark. So, you know, uh, I remained hopeful seeing all of these things coming out, thinking, government, listen, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal is telling you this, the standard is substantive equality. Like, we've got, you know, you've got to recognize that you don't, don't force us into bringing a human rights complaint. Recognize that all your, your, your programs have issues and start addressing them. And indeed, for a while, they were using the language of reform quite a bit. And so they started, they started talking about, you know, with us and also other First Nations across the country about reform in this area of social assistance. They didn't, we didn't hear substantive equality mentioned a lot, but I'm sure it was on their mind that this case and other cases. Other things that are also influencing or should be influencing the movement here is there is a new Department of Indigenous Services Act that, you know, at least in the preamble referenced that the types of services First, First Nations should receive should be needs-based and should aim to, you know, address socioeconomic gaps. Um, there's also the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that, you know, Article 21 of recognizes that Indigenous peoples have the right to social services without any discrimination and lots of other language about not only access uh, to equitable um, essential services, but also the right to self-determine in relation to them um, and have self-government in relation to them. And so there's a few other pieces of legislation that I think equally support um, arguments for self more self-determined, equitably funded services for First Nations. I won't go through all of the pieces of that. Um, but there's a lot, in my view. <laughs> the, the, the supports for this approach are just becoming more and more overwhelming. So what we have happen um, is uh, since 2016, um, in the Maritimes, particularly because we were the ones who had the court case, so they, they reacted to us first, and in the Maritimes, different groups uh, entered into agreements for the federal government to fund research to look at uh, the workings of social assistance on reserve um, and get to the bottom of it. Because they didn't believe us when we said, hey, it's super underfunded and it's a shitty program and you should fix it. Um, they're like, well, let's research that. So that's what we did. We said, fine, you want to research it? We'll, we'll research it. So we spent two years, two, two years researching it. There was a uh, group of us and I was part of that group. And not surprisingly, the results supported the things that we were saying, that the rates are too low, that they're having a huge impact on food security. Transportation, that's a huge one. A lot of communities in New Brunswick, they're kind of a little far away from um, you know, the neighboring community where they can get their groceries. And if you get $80 a week, you have to take a taxi into town and probably pay 30 bucks for your taxi, and then you have 50 bucks left for the week. Um, so it's, it's ridiculous um, that it impacts, obviously. We, we did uh, empirical um, you know, uh, research with recipients, asking them about how they felt about it. And, you know, I mean, it obviously has an impact on people's self-esteem. And people also said that they, you know, with the reference here to criminality, look to other activities that would supplement their income, sometimes of which might, you know, involve criminal elements. But when you're desperate, you're desperate. Um, yeah, so the current program rates and, and the program and the rates create dependency. Um, they don't... Uh, they don't compare to provincial programming. Um, there's also really nothing in the, so welfare off reserve, like there's this big thing called case management, where, you know, if you're on social assistance, you've got social workers who, you know, in theory are supposed to be helping you. Uh, they'll identify if you need certain programming, certain training, certain life skills, and try to move you into, you know, pro-social activities that will get you into the workforce. That's the sort of idea. There was never any real funding for case management at all. So this, that kind of programming has been happening in the provinces for years, and none of that really happens in the First Nations. At some point, there was some pilot projects where a few little pockets of First Nations got um, case management dollars, uh, 
but they don't want to extend it to everyone because I think they're, they're worried it would cost too much. So that's how they do it. We, we are now in the little pocket of First Nations who get money for, for uh, case management, but we, there's not enough of it and it's not very effective for the reasons I'll explain in a second. Um, and there are insufficient supports for the actual people who deliver the services in First Nations communities. Like I think the, the client to um, social worker ratio is something like 100, 200, 250 to one. Whereas I think in the provinces it's a lot closer to you know, a, re a manageable number of cases. But then again, there is no case management in First Nations, so all these folks are doing to some extent is you know, helping cut a check. I mean, they're trying to do their best to help other people, but they don't have the resources or the, those supports. So there's all kinds of uh, challenges here, and I won't read all of them. Um, but I will say, I, well, part of my work on this project was I looked through all the New Brunswick supports and programs that were available in 2017-18 and then I did all these interviews with social development officers on reserve to be like, do you have that? Is there that? Is there this? Is there that? And at the end of the day, we basically found that uh, more than half of the programming that was, is available to low income residents of New Brunswick are not available uh, to uh, First Nations. So uh, most of them are not directly available, only about 14 to 17 percent. And in about a quarter of the cases, there is no an analogous program whatsoever. There's a few cases where there's a federal program that kind of looks like the provincial program, but it's not, it's, it, it's, it's inadequate. And so um, and there was a bit of comparability, but uh, not less than 50%. Um, so, you know, that goes to my, it's not apples to apples comparison. Like there's just not the same level of programming and services that, that assist. Um, yeah, uh, and so at this time the federal government was starting to talk about reform more generally in social assistance and we were hopeful and they went and they did, um, they funded communities in the rest of the country to do some, not as in-depth of a research project as we did, but to identify what are some of the issues. And not surprisingly, it's the same issues we keep raising, which is uh, inadequate provision of services, inadequate support for capacity building, inadequate supports for case management and pre-employment supports, lack of community-based wraparound ancillary and holistic services, and little recognition of the right to self-determination, governance, and you know, so, uh, and also rates. Like people were also all mentioning rates as well um, in, in, the, in the problems. So after our report was done in New Brunswick, um, we then went on to like, what next with the federal government? Are you ready to, what do you want to do next, guys? And so they're like, well, let's, let's do some more researching, but this time let's research options forward. So we're like, cool, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll look at that. And they did a similar thing in New Brunswick, um, and we talked with our chiefs and our leadership, and anyway, we essentially did two things. One was look at um, developing a culturally appropriate policy to replace the 1991 policy and have updated rates that would meet people's needs. Um, and also develop an, a central administrative body to support the social development administrators within the First Nations. Because these guys were barely talking with each other, no money for professional development to talk to each other, to share information, to share interpretations of their policy documents. So there's a real need for that level of support as well. So the government, we, we spent a lot of time researching that and then in phase three, which started in around 2020, there was buy-in for the government to start implementing some of that. And so they were open to some of that. Um, and so we did, and the government did fund, uh, a Mi'kmaq and Wolostoy support lodge, which is a central administration body. It just hires like three or four people whose objective is to support the social uh, development administrators in the First Nations offer their services. Um, and there was a period during COVID where there was a recognition, I guess everyone was getting COVID relief, but there was some COVID inflation relief that was given to communities that was then kind of added to the 1991 rates to take off some of the pressure. Um, however, that just got cut in February 2024 without any real reason either, just like, yeah, it's done. Um, and, it, and, you know, New Brunswick has been at least providing uh, inflationary uh, rate, um, supplements in the last little while. So it's funny when they say they're trying to be comparable, but yet they're, you know, New Brunswick is still giving uh, inflationary relief. 
We did develop and, uh, a Mi'kmaq Wolistowe social development policy, which uh, we spent two or three years on. It was all based on conversations with the administrators, looking at best practices, different policies and different self-determining First Nations, trying to develop something that was holistic and it was informed by Mi'kmaq and Wolistowe values um, and that could be used. And also increase the rates. Um, and so it's done. That policy is done. And for the last year or so, we've been kind of spinning our wheels saying, okay, we're done, Canada. Let's implement that policy. That's what we've been doing for eight years, right? It was to get to this point. Um, and so we've consistently been hitting a brick wall now that we've kind of got to that point from the government. Um, we were told a year ago, you know, it's not us. The department is in favor of this, but you know, our authorities don't allow us to do this. You know, uh, you, you guys want to potentially offer a little more than what our authorities say because you're not necessarily mirroring the provinces. So we, we'd, have to ch we'd, have to, we'd have to first get the money to implement the rate ch and changes in rate, and then we'd have to go and change our authorities. So they told us there's this two-step process, and we're like, okay, whatever, how do we get that done? Um, and so they say, well, okay, well, it's going to have to go to cabinet and all this stuff. Anyway, essentially, we're waiting on budgets, right? We're waiting on the Canadian. They're telling us that maybe it'll come out as a budget announcement. So again, the chiefs go into hard lobbying mode. They meet with, like, the Minister Friedland, I think. They write letters to Minister Hadjik, and they say, listen, we've been working so hard to do everything you've asked us to. All we want is this policy and the increase in rates. Can we get that? And then the latest budget, no. Uh, there was no increase in rates. There was uh, some increase uh, for uh, amounts for persons with disability. And we're, we're not unhappy about that. Um, so there was some additional monies for persons with disabilities and a little bit of money on case management. Um, which, you know, is a good thing. There hasn't been case management. But no increase in rates. And, and now we've even lost the inflationary amount. And so we're still at those 1991 rates that I showed you. And so. The position of my clients is like, you know, you can have all the case management you want in the world, but if somebody can't eat and somebody can't provide for themselves, like you're just case managing their po poverty, they're not going to want to get out of that or even be able to have the wherewithal to get themselves out of that predicament if they can't, you know, if they don't have like even the basic um, levels of support that are needed. So uh, this is essentially where we are at now. Um, We've been hoping they would come back and say, we, we're, we'll find the money, we'll find it in some pocket, we'll do something. Um, and we've said, you know, and I, and I believe Nova Scotia has similarly run into this brick wall. And it seems that even though at this point we've mostly just said, listen, it's, you know, this is a problem across the country. And I think that's the, that's the thing with this government, is that if they actually like fix the problem, even though we've spent a lot of time really working very hard on the solution, I think if they provide us with money, they think that they're going to, and they should, provide money to everybody else in the province, in the country to address these inadequate rates and services. Um, but there isn't a political appetite for that. So I go back to Cindy Blackstock's um, quote at the beginning, is that discrimination is when the government doesn't think that you're worth the money. So here's where we're at. We're, we're seriously considering that and we don't mind being very upfront about it. We are thinking about litigation and maybe we should have started it sooner. I sometimes kick myself about that. How did I get seduced into like being here after nine years of working really hard on this, knowing that we would probably be at this point because Cindy said like this is probably where you will end up. But here we are. Uh, and then they're trying to figure out what is the best course of action moving forward. So I'm thinking hard about a human rights complaint, given the existing human rights complaints. Um, I've also been contemplating, you know, whether a charter action might be better, and so weighing the pros and cons. A few people have mentioned a class action. I'm not really warming to that, but I'm happy to have that conversation with other lawyers about why I'm concerned about that, that method. There's also the question of who's the right plaintiff or complainant, it's going to be fought hard. And so we have a lot of evidence for the groups in New Brunswick. Um, and, but I know that this also affects First Nations across the country. So there's a part of me that like rips out my soul being like, this affects everyone. But maybe there's a way that we bring a case and then other, other First Nations from other provinces can jump in and, and be parties to it. But our, we will focus on our, our New, Brunswick, uh, New Brunswick First Nations.
And also, timing is another thing. Do we continue to wait for this government, or, or do we just say, okay, well, we, if, if it looks like where we're going with the next government, maybe we should just start this now, and like we're going to be where we are. So, and in terms of other pathways, I don't know. I'm, I'm open to hearing any suggestions about other potential pathways. Uh, I think we've tried a few, and they're not being very successful. So. Um, that is, that's the journey that we've been on and obviously a journey that I will be continuing on. Um, whether I do, I do the human rights litigation pro bono for the next 10 years, maybe, maybe so. Um, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a real, it's a real important issue as I say and I think it doesn't get nearly enough attention because it's not sexy and it, um, uh, but it's, it's the most important thing for, for people, right? It's their existence. So that's that. I'm happy to take some questions now. Absolutely. No, they're, they're, they're a huge source of the problem. So the policy approach that Canada has take, taken to social assistance is essentially to impose provincial borders on the decision making of, so, so you get the rules that are in that province. So, so Mi'kmaq in New Brunswick are going to be treated differently from Mi'kmaq in Quebec and Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia. So there's a huge difference. Um, you know, and I was looking at some, uh, some stats. I mean, New Brunswick has the lowest social assistance rates of all the provinces in Canada within the province. And I'm pretty sure that um, the rates for First Nations are a couple thousand dollars less than that even, right? So um, it's a huge issue. And it's, yeah, it's that whole concept of comparability with the province and not looking at this issue holistically and maybe, I don't know, in a real formalistic sense, it sounds equal, but it's really not. It, it's unequal and it's not, I, as I say, not, I don't think it's addressing substantive equality. And, and that more of a national approach ought to be taken to addressing these issues. Yeah. I'm gonna take that out. It keeps making weird noises. It's done. <laughs> yeah, Rachel. Um, I know you've like, you talked a lot about uh, the policy-based approach that is taken for a lot of the programs. Is there any talk of any sort of like Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a water uh, government and biochemical like Yeah. Absolutely. So, and, and when Canada was doing that national uh, reform conversations, um, First Nations from Quebec came out hard on a proposal for legislation on child welfare, or not child welfare, sorry, social assistance, similar to what's been happening with uh, C92 and child welfare. I mean, it's, it certainly could do that. It certainly seems though that there's no, no political appetite for that. Uh, question for you yes. on, uh, on that uh, the 1991 race. Yeah, uh, and I was you know trying to absorb some of those yeah. numbers really fast. Go back to them. There we yeah, go. Yeah, like um, individual, the short term. Sorry, per month it looks like 320 um, for the monthly comprehensive analysis. Can I ask, is there are people on reserve paying rent or anything like rent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, um, although it's, it's a bit more complicated. So a lot of people live in band-owned housing, right? So earlier I mentioned, so the way it works is um, bands will have an agreement. So the First Nation government will have an agreement with CMHC to build certain amounts of housing per year. Um, sometimes there's limits on that. And if a, if a First Nation government is in something called third party management where their financing is in trouble, Sometimes it's because they've gone into deficit because of this awful programming, but like they, they can't build houses. That's a little bit of an aside, but like for example, the Tobik First Nation could not build houses for 15 years because it was in third party management, which just like increased the over, people living in overcrowded housing. So all of these things have knock on effects on each other, but I digress. But okay, so, uh, so there's CMHC funding to build houses, but it has to be repaid. Right? And there's an agreement between the band and, um, and CMHC to repay that. 
And then, so what happens a lot with people who are on social assistance, if they cannot afford, so, so the, what, so the social pays the rent, essentially, right? So the, but, but often it's not giving the person the money to pay the rent. Since it's administered by the band, the money's going to come off the top of their social assistance check to pay for uh, the amounts that are owing to uh, CMHC for the month. Come off that amount? No. Okay. Another a month. So, so yeah, so this will not include housing. Housing already has come out of it, but it's part of the allocation that goes. It's not free housing, but it, it looks a little different than, um, so yeah, there is no uh, housing requirement, but still, I mean, even for personal cost and, and food, that's, it's, it's insufficient. Yeah, and I just, I just was looking for clarification. Yeah. Absolutely um, uh, uh, hear and support your argument about substantive equality as opposed yeah. to simple comparability. I, I do think it's important just to keep in mind, and this is part of the difficulty to my mind of making arguments in this space, just how egregiously low social assistance is for folks off reserve too. I know, I know. And I'm not at all saying, oh, race to the bottom, so it should be the same terrible yeah. situation. Yeah. I don't mean that. I mean, I, I actually think this is an excellent wedge to bring yeah. attention to the, the common plight of folks. Mm -hmm. But just like at this point, I was looking at Vince Calderhead's recent analysis of the Nova Scotia budget and how our social assistance rates measure up. And uh, so like a single person uh, who's owning or renting gets, third, it's like total income of 9739 per year, which is third, or just over 30% of the official poverty line. Yeah. Like that's, you know, it's unlivable, right? Uh, and there are, you know, there's occasional things, you might get your tiny GST in addition to that. There's a couple tiny payments in addition, but it's extraordinary. So I just, I'll put that on, but then I'll about yeah. Borders. yeah. So Can I answer that one first, though? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Folks moving between on reserve and off reserve living residency, yeah. and how is that kind of like factored in to their uh, access to social either through province yeah. or through the federal? What's okay. The timing stuff that they have to meet, like yeah. So first of all, I 100% agree. Like the, the rates are just like shockingly inadequate for everybody, right? Um, and, and but the government does sort of force us into this race to the bottom uh, uh, issue. When the issues, you know, I mean, the, the context is a lot different. I mean, I guess I didn't get into all of the. It's challenging for First Nations in New Brunswick, for example, to even get employment. Perhaps, and I don't want to get into a race to the bottom, but it's probably even more uh, challenging than non-Indigenous folks, there are some challenges like the racism that exists in New Brunswick, and there's quite a fair bit of it. There's also the bilingualism requirement, and most Mi'kmaq and Wollastaway in the province don't speak French, and so that, that isn't a barrier in itself, and I would say intergenerational effects in how people have been affected affect their ability to, you know, um, get out and get a job, right? So there, there's that challenge. But like, absolutely. And I was looking at the New Brunswick rates last night too, just across the province. They're abhorrent, right? They're so low. I think I was looking at like 8,000 maybe, but I think the rate is still less for First Nations, but it's nothing that anyone can really live on. And I guess the thing is, many of the people who are on social outside yeah. the reserve are also indigenous people. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So it's not a, I don't yeah. think that all this yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and and so the current approach around on reserve off reserve is like immediately as you leave the reserve you have to go into the provincial system. And and most indigenous folks have a real difficulty accessing the services. So they actually tend to do worse on provincial social assistance because they don't know how to access it or they're having challenges with it. Um, there's difficulties in perhaps paying the rent because that's sort of an obligation that comes in as part of it. So there's lots of challenges. As part of the policy we started developing, the, the social development administrators recognizing A, like the massive housing issues on reserve and how there's not sufficient housing stock and that lots of people have are pushed to having to live outside reserve and they don't want to and they want to continue to get services from the First Nations. Um, They've had to, uh, so what we tried, they tried to kind of do a middle line, like if people are just living outside the borders of the community and because they can't live anywhere else because they need housing, they should still have services, uh, uh, the on-reserve services. Um, the federal government was sort of hummed and hawed about whether it would have been willing to. I mean, 
essentially they don't want to pay the rates no matter what, but they, they seem to, um, yeah, they, um, there was a they were trying to sort of fix that solution so that people didn't feel so isolated. Because what we've heard is that people who then go on to provincial social feel extremely isolated and often don't know how to access most of the services. So there's, um, there's a really interesting report that Hula, um, Hula from UNB. Hula Hughes. Hughes, Hula Hughes did a few years ago and it was uh, interviewing uh, homeless youth from Fredericton, Moncton and St. John and just uh, um, talking to them about their experiences and uh, like most of them didn't know how to access services. Most of them were homeless. Um, and so, yeah, there's this huge issue of like, because it's a very permeable mobile group and going on and off and, and the housing issues on reserve exacerbate that people are gonna go off. And so, yeah, you're right that it's the same groups of people. Yeah, Matt. So thank you so much. Um, I'd love to hear more about your thinking about which litigation pathway to pursue. <laughs> and part of why I'm asking is just thinking from my broad understanding of how long the Caring Society case took. Yeah. Because the class action, while has probably lots of downsides that I'm not thinking of, mm. getting the certification, which would, would seem like a shorter time frame than what's happened with some of the human rights. Yeah. Points. So I'm just curious, can you, maybe it's not that. Yeah, I guess I, I feel that like human, the human uh, with the caring society decision, with the Dominic decision, there are others like the 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 adjudicators will know, right? And there's a standard of substantive equality, and there's the precedents that are within that, right? Um, so I'm a little nervous about charter litigation, um, and then the question is who the, um, the 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 client would be. So if it was the First Nations, a sort of representative of. Um, of their of their communities, um, then yeah, I have debated between like is provincial superior court versus federal court. I'm probably more comfortable with federal court just in terms of sort of their knowledge on indigenous issues. So a lot of this also is like the knowledge uh, or the assumed knowledge that I can expect of the decision makers, right, and how open or receptive they're going to be. Because Canada's going to fight this hard, and like, even in the case that we had, they're playing the stereotypes, right? Like, oh, you know, First Nations, they always want more than everyone else. They want more than the people on reserve. It's not fair. They're so greedy. You know, it's that sort of narrative I found that was coming out. I mean, not as explicitly as I'm putting it, but there were certainly arguments about like, oh, well, they just want more. You know, um, and so I'm worried about who that goes to. So I'm thinking about that. That's just one reason I gravitate to human rights. I also think about the, the prohibition against retaliation at the human rights. And so, because there will be retaliation and there has been retaliation in the past, like funding gets cut, programs get cut, other things get cut. So when sometimes you, you sue the government, um, that's happened in the past. I can give some examples. Cindy Blackstock has talked about how all the funding got pulled out of the Caring Society. She was blocked from going to certain meetings. So these things do happen. They happened back then, and it's possible they can happen again. Um, yeah, so there's the charter, but I also worry about class actions and just, because there are class actions that are going on now, and like, do you bring it in the name of the recipients? Is it more forward-looking than, than uh, backwards-looking? And I'm mostly, like concern, I want remedies, right, that are going to be systemic, uh, long term, and despite the fact that the Caring Society and the Human Rights Tribunal still has jurisdiction over, I'm not, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Uh, I mean, they're still sort of figuring it out and there's still issues, but, um, you know, a declaration that Canada, you, you've been bad, like that's not going to do it. Like we need more robust remedies, and so part of me gravitates more to human rights because there's such a culture of like those remedies being available, whereas like, even with the charter and, and litigation, although maybe it's more meaningful because it's the charter than you know it's the constitution. But I, I worry about the remedial what what they'll ha what will be available in terms of remedies. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Richard. Good talk, as usual. Um, <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Bad <laughs> <laughs> jurisdiction. Is there any way that there could be conversations? With the new Liberal government in New Brunswick, and uh, just for conversation support, those sorts of issues was one question. Yeah. And then the second one is, I didn't fully get your rule of law argument earlier, mm. but a further elaboration of that might also help us think about which of the litigation strategies might be better with judicial. If it's a rule of law argument, judicial review maybe the one that helps us in that direction. Yeah. Um, so. I think there's conversations that can be had for the provinces for uh, um, for providing more services than they are currently providing. In fact, the, the the Social Assistance Act in New Brunswick actually says it doesn't apply on reserves. 
um, which is ironic because that's the, what Canada kind of uses to pro uh, provide standards. Um, but I think, you know, First Nations don't want to be put under the province necessarily. They, 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 they see that as an affront to self-determination. Um, and so I don't think it's the full solution. It per perhaps there's de definitely an, o an, an opening for greater conversation, but uh, I think both partners have to be at the table. This is, I think it's a, a double aspect area where both governments should be playing more of an important, robust role, and they haven't. And there's a Supreme Court of Canada case we're waiting on from, on the policing side um, uh, where they might be saying a lot more about that and the obligations of government. So that might be helpful in terms, and they're saying it in terms of the honor of the crown. On the rule of law point, what I was getting at is that um, there's no legislation. This has all been done by policy, relying on like what that document from 1964 uh, that often gets sort of touted as well. We can't do any different. I'm sort of treating it like a constitutional provision. This tiny little document from 1964 that essentially gives them the ability to fund these services. Um, where did it go? Uh, anyway, um, and so. There's a lot of room for interpretation by different gov levels of government in terms of that. There's no standards about how to fund, who to fund, where to fund. Um, there's, uh, and there's, you know, it's essentially the standard is comparability and different governments will interpret that in different ways. And so it gives a lot of discretion to interpret which can be abused and which I will say that was abused by the Harper government when they introduced those changes back in 2011 that we fought. Right, so they, um, you know, they essentially said we're taking a very narrow interpretation, and that's that's the standard. So there's there's lots of there's and the Auditor General of Canada has on several occasions now reviewed this program and other Indigenous programs and decried the lack of clear standards, clear funding standards, clear le no legislation. So that's that's what I mean by rule of law. Too much discretion not enough uh, um, legislated clear standards that we can hold the government accountable to. There's been, so there's been very little to actually hold the government accountable to. Um, and so we brought that judicial review, I guess that's a mechanism, but judicial review and reflecting on that case, um, you know, it didn't change anything. All it did was maintain the status quo, which we were desperately trying to maintain. So it didn't, you know, say anything about substantive equality, it just said like, you know, so, uh, so I, I don't think judicial review is the right mechanism because it's, it's only going to be looking at the decision that is challenged and not the overall problems with this, um, this, this program. So that's, so, so judicial review is certainly not one that I want to pursue um, versus the other ones that I mentioned. Yeah. Well, there's one last quick question. I hate to to do this and wrap it up, but we're getting close to 25 past the hour, which is kind of our, our termination time. So I think I'm going to have to do that. Okay. With okay, the boss. understanding that, of course, Professor Metallic is here in such a foundational way. She's here. <laughs> she can't get rid of me. She's like, she's so loud as my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I had mentioned at the outset was that this session was brought to you by uh, not just the Health Justice Institute, uh, but our friends, the Healthy Populations Institute at Dow, we're co-hosts co and co-convening and you know, co-interested in bringing this conversation to bear uh, today. So thanks to them as well. Uh, I've heard pieces of this story before in administrative law where yeah. Naomi has been so generous to come and speak to students about her origin story of the Simon case <laughs> and some of that, you know, the battle of judicial review and its, its limits. Uh, continuing story, as you say, uh, but I hadn't heard so much of it. So you know, clearly brought together with the entire kind of um, advocacy piece and and uh, social justice piece that you've been working for for so long, together with community. Um, and so that was that was really a formidable, really a um, incredibly profound story that you've told us. Want to thank you. Yeah. Uh, for that, I also want to say to people, if you're interested in more sort of reading around this area, um, something else uh, Professor Mattel has been involved in is Cash Back, the Yellowhead Institute's follow-up to their land back uh, work. And when we look at that in our poverty law class, and there's a lot of really important pieces brought together around lack of, uh, you know, substantive equality on these measures of reasonable comparability and so on. So more, more can be learned from the very accessible Cash Back uh, work that Yellowhead Institute 
has done. Uh, and last, before um, a closing thank you, I just want to note that we have coming up a last uh, health justice seminar this term, Friday, November 22nd, co-hosted by the African Nova Scotian Justice Institute and East Coast Prison Justice Society. The title is No Health Justice Without Black Justice, Systemic Discrimination in Canada's Prisons and Jails, and that's L. Jones, uh, L's sister, Zilla Jones, uh, who is a lawyer and was uh, one of the writers of the Black Canada's Black Justice Strategy, uh, and Randolph Riley, who is a lived experience expert. So I look forward to having you come back for that session. And again, now, center stage, thank you so much. Thank you.